I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living, Leon, Nicaragua. I just watched Tony Travels as he did his video, Nicaragua's Best Town for Digital Nomads, San Juan del Sur. And I need to do some follow-up on this. Sorry, Tony, it was a good video, and I appreciate you coming to Nicaragua and doing videos. He's got a lot of good content. Go check him out, Tony Travels on YouTube. Uh, but we're going to do a little bit of correction and, and filling in some information, I think, about his video. We're going to get to that right after the bump. All right, so if you watch Tony's video, first of all, he's been around Nicaragua, so he's not just popping in like a backpacker into uh, San Juan del Sur doing the traditional advertising and popping out again. He's actually spent uh, months in Nicaragua and is getting to know the country a little bit, so fantastic. We're glad to have you here. Tony's been here in Leon. For some reason, he decided not to come hang out with me while I was here. No, I don't know if he knew who I was. He did not say anything, um, but <laughs> we did not uh, cross paths while he was here in Leon, but he went on to San San Juan del Sur, and he has this video saying that Nicaragua's best town for digital nomads is San Juan del Sur, and I think nothing could be more backwards. There is really no place in populated Nicaragua that could be worse for an average digital nomad than San Juan del Sur. That's not to say that S, uh, SJDS isn't awesome and amazing and that you shouldn't go, and that even as a digital nomad you may want to go despite the fact that it is the worst place for the digital nomad aspect of your life, but... Let's cover that. Okay, so before we get into why San Juan del Sur is probably the worst place if you want to be a digital nomad, there's a couple things from the video that I want to touch on. Some of them will relate to San Juan del Sur and some are more general. First, uh, is he does mention, he goes into a panaderia and uh, looks at Diditos de Queso and says, what are these? And they said, Diditos, which means little fingers. Uh, and he said, oh, Doritos? Doritos is not a Spanish word. Uh, so Ranchitos are the Doritos equivalent here, but the food that you know as Doritos in the United States is enchiladitas here in Nicaragua. And as far as I know, this is actually where it comes from. So Doritos are a copy of food from Central America, and we have other brands that make higher quality Dorito equivalent chips up in Honduras. We don't really make them here because enchiladitas are made here and they're made locally. So you can go to any, uh, any, any grocery store, any gas station and pick up locally made enchiladitas, which are a lot like Doritos, but they have more flavor. They're fresh because they're normally made that morning. Uh, and they're, they're made into a circular kind of, kind of shape instead of being more or less flat. But other than that, it's basically the same thing. Imagine if you had Doritos, that were fresh and not full of preservatives, and they curled them a bit more. And there you go, that's about what it is. So those are everywhere. That's enchiladitas. Doritos is just an American marketing word so they can trademark it. And here, but it's important to know, the food here in Nicaragua, we use the term dados or fingers all the time, much like the British do in English. Americans don't tend to. So Americans only tend to be really familiar, at least most Americans, with this terminology for food if we're familiar with British terminology for food. If you watch British television a lot, you're gonna be familiar with Doctor Who, Matt Smith's character constantly wanting to eat fish fingers. And that makes sense when you hear it, you're not totally shocked, but we typically call them fish sticks in the United States. So you don't necessarily connect uh, those things. Or if you're getting uh, cheese sticks, it's mozzarella sticks if it's going to be the breaded ones or cheese sticks or just cheese, right? We use sticks quite a bit and depending on the context depends what it is. Not too different here in Nicaragua, but we never say sticks. We say fingers or little fingers and that gives you some amount of determination. In many cases, it's just a size thing and it's worth noting that the ito or ita, if it's feminine, ending on a word just denotes little. Uh, and so uh, a, a just anything. Right, you, you people add in this area once in a while, they'll add it as like a cute way of saying things. But if you're down in Colombia, they say it constantly. They just add it to all kinds of words, name a thing and just add ita or ito onto the end of it. And it's just a cute way of saying it, right? Um, so Americans are used to this just in different ways, right? Uh, but um, with food, typically if you're getting dedos de pescado, dedos de pollo, the fingers of fish, fingers of chicken, chicken fingers and fish fingers as we would say it, 
they tend to be pretty large, more like chicken strips, right? Or, or bigger than you would say fish sticks. Like when we say fish sticks, we mean something about the size of a mozzarella stick. But here, when you say dado de pescado, you're actually getting something like we would consider like long strips of fish filet that are breaded. And it's not the kind of thing we eat too often in the United States, so we don't have a really common term for it. But here, dado de whatever are super common, and you expect to eat them all the time. And so breaded chicken, breaded fish, uh, that's then fried and then you dip in something like chicken strips absolutely everywhere. This is one of the every restaurant has it when you have Nicaraguan food everybody serves dados. That is so common and it's not just for kids people just that's what people eat a lot of the time so it's a, it's a popular thing. When you say dados de queso obviously you can't just take a slab of cheese that large and fry it like that. Okay you could and it would be delicious and more people should do that. But that's not what they mean. What they actually do is something more similar to a food from Venezuela where they take uh, a small amount of cheese, not as much as like a mozzarella stick um, or, or a, a what we would call a cheese stick, the, the string cheese in the United States. It's less than one of those, maybe a third of one of those. And then they wrap it in a breading and then they bake or fry that. And so it's mostly bread. It's more similar to like cheesy crazy bread from uh, from Little Caesars or something like that where it's primarily a bread item but it has certainly some amount of cheese running the length of it and so that's a dado de uh, queso and those are really popular to be sold one at a time. Um, sometimes nearly the same thing is sold as a churro de queso and so that exists as well. You could see it either way. Technically they're normally slightly different but not necessarily. They can overlap quite a bit. But if you think about it, churros are basically bread fingers, so it, it really isn't that different. Um, and, and so that is the dado de queso. If you're going to get deditos de chicken, deditos, uh, de, deditos de chicken, wow, deditos de pollo, or deditos de pescado, which are little fish fingers, then you're getting, uh, in the fish case, much closer to American fish sticks in size. In the case of chicken, it's more like chicken nuggets. Uh, and if you're talking about cheese, then it generally changes to what we call mozzarella sticks. Uh, so you're going to get that solid piece of cheese that's been breaded and fried. But those are basically the things to know. If you're going into a bakery, no matter what size it is, it's going to be the bready one. They're not, they don't, they're not frying them, right? They're baking them. So it's always going to be the larger style. Uh, but so that's something you need to know. So you're going to hear that and read it on things all the time. And it's not going to be a word that you generally learn when you're learning Spanish in North America. And I don't think a lot of the Latin American world uses those terms often. When I lived in Spain, we never saw that, right? It was just, it's not a food that they eat. They don't eat things in finger form, but here in Latin America, it is super common, at least in this region. And so knowing what dedos and dedidos means will make all of your food hunting that much easier easier. As far as the money conversion in the same place, he said, how much were these? And she said, 40 cord. And this highlights a couple things. One is that you always work in Cordoba unless you're only here for a day. If you're just popping in from Costa Rica, you don't have time to hit an ATM. You're just like, I got a few hours. I want to say I was in Nicaragua and I want to eat something. Okay. Blow your money with American money. It just makes sense. But if you're staying for any amount of time, switch to Cordoba and don't keep being a tourist using American dollars, no matter what people are willing to accept, um, because a lot of things are going to happen. One is you're not going to learn how to do your conversions in your head. So you're going to make mistakes and people are going to be able to take advantage of that. And two, it's annoying to the businesses and they're going to round up on you. So in general, when things are billed in dollars, they're not going to rip you off. We use dollars throughout the country. It is legal currency. It is completely normal. You can get it from the ATM. And this tempts tourists to remain very touristy and not use and learn the local currency. And if, again, if you're only here for a day, maybe two, okay. And if you can use a credit card for most things, okay. But Tony's definitely been here already for weeks or months and he's still using US dollars. That should have stopped the moment he was over the border and could get to an ATM. So when he went up, he did a couple things. He showed on the video that 40 cords equals a dollar, which is not correct. It's 37 cords to the dollar right now. And it does move from time to time, but not very often. It moves basically every six to 18 months. Uh, and it's very well documented. The government puts out notices as to what the changes are, when it's happening, what it is, and then the fluctuations are by itty bitty percentages that we really don't notice. You can go to anywhere on the street and get your money changed. You can do it in an ATM and you 
you can use credit cards to go either way. There's lots of ways to handle it, um, but so the conversion is very well known. So in this particular case, it shows a number of things that happen. One is he was unaware of the exchange rate. It should be one of the first things you learn. Before you arrive in a new country, you should have a fair idea of what the exchange rate is on things because that's going to be a place you get taken advantage of very easily. So he said, uh, oh, one dollar. But that was wrong because really what you're looking at is like a dollar eight dollar nine maybe you can do the conversion but it's less than ten percent but it's certainly more than five percent more than a dollar for 40 quart now if you're like nicaraguans or anyone who's been here more than a day you're just dealing with cord and 40 cord is a normal amount of money you deal with you just pull out your tens or twenties and you count them up to 40 and completely by coincidence i have exactly 40 cord sitting here in front of me with four tens right so this is about a dollar nine and this would be normal you have it in your pocket, and if you just have two 20s or, or four 10s, there you go. Or you have a 50, and this gives you 10, 10 quarters change. Like, life is easy, and everything's priced that way. Well, when he said $1, she's like, I'm not giving you a 10% discount because you're using American money, which doesn't help her. She probably has a quarter of a bank account, so she's going to round up. So she said $2, because remember, or be aware, there's no change here for US dollars. The smallest increment is $1, or 37 Cordoba increments. So anything that isn't exactly in increments of 37 Cordoba, it has to round somewhere, because under the hood, it's Cordoba instruments being used. And so if you're going to use dollars, of course, they're not going to round down to give the foreigners a discount for being annoying and not using the local currency and being rich foreigners who can afford to travel. No, of course they're not. They're going to round up. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what they should do. But you shouldn't be using dollars unless that's what you expect. So in this case, we watched Tony lose 92 cents on a $1.08 transaction, almost double. And for that one moment, who cares? But if he's doing this day after day and trying to be some kind of cost-conscious traveler, that's going to be a very big difference having a 90% markup or more on potentially food items and, and simple things where most of us are like, oh, I can go eat for $1 to $2. He's going to be like, man, I can't eat for less than 3 to $4. And be like, how is that happening? Oh, paying in dollars will do it. When we say we can eat for 2 or $3, yes, in Cordoba, right? That's just, that's what you carry around. I don't have U.S. dollars anywhere. I don't carry it around. You can pay your rent in it. You can pay a car payment in it. Um, you can pay a hotel in it. Like big, big items often will price in dollars and then convert to Cordoba. If they're, if they're giving you a price in dollars up front, fine, use dollars if you want. But because they do take, like you can use a, a credit card in Nicaragua and pay in dollars and never have a conversion, that's fine. Right, if, if that's what you're doing. But when you're out on the street and you're buying things, make sure you're using Cordoba or you're going to force a rounding situation where it doesn't work. If you're paying a, a $300 rent and it has to round by less than a dollar, then okay, yes, you may still be losing that dollar, but that's a maximum of once a month on a very large transaction. But when you're dealing with some de de pescado or something or queso like this, little tiny bread items, you could be looking at a every single transaction could be could be close to doubled. So 90 cents on $300 is very little. Like that's less than, uh, it's about a quarter of a percent. But when you're talking about this, is like 92%. So like wildly different numbers. Um, so, so things to be careful of. That alone will make everything in Nicaragua not make sense as far as how expensive it is. And sometimes we get these people who are like, Nicaragua's crazy expensive, and we're always trying to figure out what they're doing to end up paying so much for things that are so cheap. I doubt this is what they're doing, but this is an example of two things. Know your conversion, work with local currency. Don't be the American, or in this case, the Canadian behaving like an American. It's weird because it's not even his currency. Um, but those mistakes will throw things off really quickly. Uh, internet speeds. So, so this will play into why San Juan del Sur isn't the best. But he mentions that they get really fast in San Juan del Sur with up to 100 by 100 internet. And he's right, you have to say 100 by 100 or the speed doesn't make any sense. And yes, you can, they do have fiber, it does go up to 100. But in the rest of the country, we have fiber and we go much faster than that. So we wouldn't consider 100 by 100. 100 by 100 might seem fast to a North American. If you're coming from the US or Canada, these seem like fast speeds uh, to much, especially to Canada. Coming to Central America, these are not fast speeds. These are slow speeds. You get 500 and up all over the country uh, for cheap 
but not in San Juan del Sur typically. I'm sure you actually can get better than this, uh, but it's it's very far flung and, and San Juan del Sur doesn't have the faster speeds. But I've also done lots of videos explaining why you don't care and it doesn't actually matter that you can go that fast. 30 by 30 is more than enough for most digital nomads. 50 by 50 is great for extreme content creators like me who are uploading absolutely insane amounts of data every day. 50 by 50 is completely adequate. Even for, in my case, we have a household of about eight people, all of which who are very heavy internet users, and 50 by 50 is so fast that we can never really saturate it in any meaningful way, even using, you know, uh, BitTorrent and, and Netflix on high quality and all kinds of things all throughout the day and moving, because I'm moving my own giant high quality video files up and down all day long. Um, you know, when you're talking about like a movie you're getting online, a two hour movie might be like four or five gig in size. Uh, like if you're downloading something in 4K from Netflix, but when I'm uploading this show, it could be 50 or 60 gig in size, for real. Like we're moving outrageous amounts. The, the level of quality that we're shooting at is so far beyond streaming services that it's actually pretty funny. And then YouTube actually cranks it down quite a bit. But if you set the video to all the way up to the 4K setting and everything, the quality on YouTube jumps quite a bit. If you're on like 720p, it actually turns down the quality, not just the resolution. It actually compresses the stream more so you get more fuzz and stuff uh, even at the same resolution. So just something to be aware of. Okay, so those are the big things. He did also show the beach cleanup. I just want to point out that like up in the northern beaches, we have regular weekly cleanups as well. That stuff happens everywhere. And a lot of the beaches do get naturally cleaned up because this is a cultural thing and it's horrible and, and awesome at the same time. Uh, there are people who go around and make their living by recycling trash. But because there are, people often leave trash in obvious places for them to come pick up. So it's easier for them to get and because they're being lazy. And so it depends if it's like a straw or a plastic bag, that's littering. But if it's someone carefully setting down a can or something where it's obvious, that's leaving something for someone to recycle. It's weird. I've been at really big like party events where it's like a huge crowd of people and you see people like set a can down and you're like, you're just, you're just intentionally putting crap on the ground. And then seconds later, a guy comes by and says, thank you and picks it up and puts it in his bag and takes it off. And you're like, oh, they were just leaving it for that guy. Like, that's really weird. But when I lived in the middle of La Boreal, kids would come by and be like, do you have any bottles and cans for me? We'd scour the house, find anything that we hadn't thrown out yet, anything that hadn't gone to recycling, hand it all to him. He'd be like, thanks. He'd collect bags of it, whatever he could get, and go house to house asking for that stuff. So it, that's real. All right. So why is San Juan del Sur the worst place in Nicaragua for a digital nomad. All right, so let's break down what matters for a digital nomad. There's some basic things. Remember, a digital nomad is not a general content creator. A digital nomad is not an expat, is not a retiree. A digital nomad specifically refers to a person who is working in the digital space online. And so there, obviously this is a huge category and we're gonna generalize really horribly, but this is critical because when we talk about what matters for a digital nomad, backpackers are not digital nomads, right? They may be nomads, but they're not online workers. Or maybe they are, but it's not their main thing. Like they're, they're there to party and backpack and they're trying to make enough money to keep them doing that. Digital nomads are people who are working and manage to have a nomadic lifestyle while doing it. I have been a digital nomad for 25 years. This is something I do a lot now. Right now, I'm more or less stationary in Nicaragua, but this is not the country I came from, and I'm constantly moving from place to place. Here, I'm able to work online. I do all kinds of stuff. I am still a digital nomad. I'm just not as nomadic as I was, but I'm still nomadic. And I will be, in just a few weeks, working from the United States and working from Mexico, and pretty soon, hopefully, working from South America and other parts of Central America as well. So I, I remain nomadic. I was just working in Bolivia recently. So... Digital nomads care about a few things. Internet quality, power quality, stability, safety, cost, because it's a job-related thing. The more you pay, the less you earn. Um, and visas. But we're not going to worry about that because that applies at a country level and we're just talking about Nicaragua. So even though we have a video about how Nicaragua has like the most amazing digital nomad visas you could possibly imagine, Everywhere in Nicaragua has the same visa, so it doesn't matter inside the country which one is better. It's all the same. But so the other things, safety, cost, and quality of internet or infrastructure, we'll say, because power and internet typically are good or bad together. And in all these things, this is really huge. In every aspect that matters under the digital nomad banner. Now, things that we didn't mention because they are not general 
to the digital nomad experience is the view, the weather, the, the you know, size of the crowds, the nightlife. Those things are personal choices. Some people want loud places. Some people want quiet. Some people want country. Some people want mountains. Some people want beach. Some people want, right? Those things are all personal preferences. And those could play a very big role for you. But from the perspective of digital nomading, they are irrelevant. What matters to digital nomads is these other things in a general digital nomad sense, like saying what things matter to professional surfers. Oh, well, you know, the quality of the waves, the accessibility of the beach, uh, is, it, is it on the registry of places for, for competition or whatever? There's things that would matter. And you could say, yes, but there's a much more beautiful view and a really great party and wonderful restaurants up in this mountain. It may have views of the ocean, but it's far away. And the surfer would be like, yes, but I need to surf. Right, so digital no from the perspective of the digital nomad aspect, we care that they're able to work effectively. And so in every aspect, in which digital nomads would evaluate a place within Nicaragua. San Juan del Sur is the most expensive. It is not the most dangerous, but it is close to the most dangerous. It is much more dangerous than alternative locations. You can find places that are more, more dangerous, such as inner city rough barrios in Managua, but it's only small portions of Managua, and they are not places that digital nomads would be attracted to for other reasons as well. So it's unlikely to come up, but technically there are places that could be worse in that particular aspect. And then in, as it comes to infrastructure, San Juan del Sur is also among the worst because it is a very small community, very far flung from populated Nicaragua. It is at the edge of the power supply and it is at the edge of the internet supply and it is at the farthest point, more or less, of the internet supply. The internet comes into the country at the northeast corner of the country and San Juan del Sur sits at the southwest. So it is the farthest distance, more or less, that an internet connection would transit in all of the country. And a lot of places are about equal, so it's not specifically horrible, but it is anything but a good location. So your internet is less reliable. Your internet is slower. Your internet has higher latency. Your internet is more expensive in many cases. Your power is less reliable. Your cost of living as far as housing is higher. Your cost of food is much higher, often double to quadruple what it is the rest of the country. Uh, and then your safety is not the worst, but on the very close to the worst side. Now, none of that is to say that San Juan del Sur is a bad place. San Juan del Sur is beautiful. San Juan del Sur is full of restaurants. It has a beautiful bay. It has a lot of activities. It has a number of locals. It has a lot of expats. It has a lot of tourists. It has people flowing through. So depending on what you want to do, you know, you want great nightlife, you want places to eat, all those things are great. And you get that in San Juan del Sur. So if you're prioritizing those things above the specific needs of being a digital nomad and are willing to sacrifice. Well, I'm gonna pay more so my paycheck doesn't go as far. I can't digital nomad as much. I can't go out to eat as often. And maybe you get paid so much as a digital nomad that you don't care about saving money or being frugal at all. And at some point, cost is no, no object. Then you're very unlikely to be in San Juan del Sur, honestly. If the thing you want is Nicaraguan culture, San Juan del Sur has the least of it. If you were really into the Nicaraguan scene, you would choose somewhere else in the country naturally. If what you wanted to do was party and have just endless resources and do all those things that San Juan del Sur ups the ante on in Nicaragua a little bit, but you had endless money, you would probably pick someplace like Costa Rica or Panama or Mexico or Colombia where you can get many more things if you're willing to spend the money or able to spend the money. So San Juan del Sur falls into a middle ground of being in a place that doesn't have a lot of resources but doesn't necessarily have the culture of that place. And so there are reasons why it can be really good, like it has this visa that's easy to get, uh, and it's still not that expensive. It's nowhere near as expensive as Costa Rica, but because you're lacking in those things, you, you basically, it's only going to be viable or of interest to people who are falling into the ground of, they really want the kinds of things that Costa Rica has to offer, but they can't afford them there. So they are still on a budget, and that's why they're in Nicaragua. Otherwise, they would be somewhere else in Nicaragua someplace that is safer, someplace that has better internet, someplace that has better power, someplace that has more Nicaraguan culture, uh, and someplace that has uh, uh, faster connections to everything. So, and costs less to live, right? A fraction to live, possibly a very big fraction, right? The, the difference in cost of living can be significant, right? I mean, we're really talking 
double or more generally to live in San Juan del Sur. So as a digital nomad, imagine picking San Juan del Sur. And he also says, well, thank goodness the digital nomads haven't heard about San Juan del Sur or the place would be packed. Trust me, digital nomads everywhere in the world are aware of San Juan del Sur. It is so well known on the global tourism circuit as a as like the Tulum of, of uh, Nicaragua, which Tulum is overrun with tourists, right? And every time you go to San Juan del Sur, I know he says, well, there's a lot of locals. When you go there and you look in his, his camera, there are backpackers just everywhere on the streets. Those are the prime streets. That isn't like out somewhere. That isn't like near a hostel. It's all near a hostel. There's hostels everywhere in town. Everything is based around tourism. Uh, and so and that's why all the restaurants are more expensive. When you don't have very many tourists, it keeps the prices down, but San Juan del Sur doesn't have that. It's definitely tourist-based, and the empty areas are because tourists own those lots and aren't building. So when you're looking at digital nomad, trust me, digital nomads who are coming anywhere near this portion of Latin America are extremely aware of San Juan del Sur and by and large are either going there and moving on or not going there at all because it is very apparent that it's not actually a good spot for digital nomads to stop and work. A digital nomad who's stopping there for a vacation for a couple days or a week, absolutely. A backpacker who is going to someday be a digital nomad, absolutely. But for an active digital nomad who needs to be able to work, the constant noise, the constant party, the lifestyle, the nonstop tourist aspect where everything is being pushed at you. You walk down the street, people are trying to sell you things, people are trying to pull you into restaurants, things that don't happen in the rest of the country because it's not a tourist scene, right? It, well, except in Granada. That does happen on the in the Calzado in, in Granada. But because as a digital nomad, all that stuff gets in the way of working, right? People will come knock on your door. People will scream in your windows, be just like in downtown Granada, right? Because they're trying to get your attention. They want to sell you something even when you're home. And, and he mentioned, well, there's cafes. Yes, there's, that's not really where digital nomads work. That is a misconception. Um, that's something that people who don't digital nomad generally say. It is important to have backup locations should your main home office or whatever not be functional and it's nice to know there's a cafe you can go to, but cafes specifically are not particularly good for that. So first of all, here in Nicaragua, a lot of cafes don't provide any kind of working space uh, for someone who needs a digital nomad for the day, and those that do often don't have very good internet. That's not something that people commonly provide because people don't go to cafes to work like that here. We don't have that cafe work culture thing. That's kind of unique to certain areas of the world. You wouldn't get the, in Italy either. Um, and so while in Mexico, you may very easily, and I have staff in Mexico where they have lots of power problems, it is common for people to go, I, I need somewhere to work, and they go to a cafe. And that's a cultural thing that they do. But here in Nicaragua, they do not, partially because our power is much more reliable and we don't need to do that very often, but also because we don't have the cafe culture of using that as a workplace. But you can go to any number of restaurants and do that. There are places you can go and do that. You have options and cafes are one of them, just not as good. But the idea that as an actual, an actual digital nomad who actually has a job, who's actually getting paid, not just someone who wants to be, not someone who's backpacking and is like, I need to get online because I need to look like I'm working so my parents keep paying me, right? But an actual digital, digital nomad rarely wants to sit in a situation where they're expected to pay for expensive coffee and pay regularly, like you're not gonna get one cup and wait for four hours, maybe an hour, but then you're gonna get something else. Maybe you get a slice of cake, maybe another cup of coffee. That starts adding up. It's hard to be a cost-effective digital nomad if you're constantly paying to be in a cafe. It just doesn't make sense most of the time. And cafes generally make a bit of noise. And a lot of digital nomads, a very large number, need to be able to carry on conversations, leave voice messages, do other things that are very uncomfortable or unprofessional to do in a cafe environment. So there's a lot of reasons why it doesn't work for normal digital nomads. There's going to be exceptions. There's going to be someone who thrives on the noise, someone who doesn't need like an office space and all they need is the smallest laptop and they, they are never need to make phone calls. They never need to listen to anything. They never need to concentrate uh, apart from noise. Some people, I know some people can concentrate with noise and some can't, but that, that works for them. That is by far the exception. That is maybe one to five percent of digital nomads uh, that are able to do that. And I think you would find that of those, it's a very small percentage who would find that they would thrive and want to do that at the cost. Um, so, and I know from my own staff, because all of my 
in my company is digital nomads, right? We are loaded with digital nomads. So not only am I one, but I work with many and I see them from both the worker side and the employer side. And when they move to cafes and stuff because of a power outage, they tell me, oh, I'm gonna be offline for 20 minutes heading out to a cafe. Okay, cool. And when they're at the cafe, they're like, this is so awkward. It's so hard to get work done, right? It's a, it's a reason to struggle. And they'll say, no, I can't take a phone call right now. I can't hear, or people will, you'll hear other people talking, like it's weird. And if you were in a cafe and people were at actually being active digital nomads, you'd be like, oh gosh, yeah, that's that's super annoying. Of course, if all you have to do is maybe edit a, a, a proposal you're putting together, sure, you can do that one limited thing from a cafe, but it's not a place to work. If you're a professional working digital nomad, with rare exception, you need to have your apartment or house or whatever you have set up with an office space and be able to work. Now, it may be a very casual space, nothing like I have with, you know, triple monitors and three different computers and, you know, studio lights and, and the whole nine yards. I have a lot going on. I'm much more permanent, but I also move this stuff with me all the time. I bring quite a bit of uh, equipment with me even when I'm on the road uh, and I set up like I take time to make a working space wherever I am. Um, that is not for everybody, right? There is a happy middle ground, but going and working in cafes does not add to that in any meaningful way. And if it did, there are cafes that are more quiet all throughout the country and certainly safer. You're at real danger of when you're a digital nomad, you have to have computers and stuff, right? By the nature of being a digital nomad, those things can be grabbed and people can run very quickly. And in San Juan del Sur, while not common, that is a risk. And in most of the country, it is not a risk. It's still foolish to leave your computer unattended, but it is not uncommon for people we know to leave their phone and go, oh my gosh, I left my phone somewhere 30 minutes ago and go back to a restaurant and find it still sitting on the table. That's, it's really not a big fear that people are gonna grab your stuff. You do need to not leave it. I am in no way recommending that you leave your stuff sitting on a table. I'm just saying that if you did, chances are you'd be safe outside of San Juan del Sur. And of course, the inner city, but like no one's sitting around at a cafe in the inner city. It's just not a popular thing to do. Uh, so, so San Juan del Sur really doesn't fit the mix for digital nomads in any way. If you're thinking about any factor that matters for digital nomads, I think you would say, oh, yeah, no, it would be the first place I would rule out in the country. Maybe Granada, but Granada is a bigger city with way better infrastructure. It's in the core. So it's in the area where they have really good power, really good internet, um, the cost isn't quite as high as San Juan del Sur, but it is quite a bit higher than other places. And you can get to quieter parts of the city, but most everyone's going to be in the less quiet parts where it's a lot of tourists. So it's still not a great option. But beyond that, Managua, Masaya, Hinotepe, Didiamba, San Marcos, Leon, Nagarote, La Paz Centro, Chinadega, Matagalpa, Hinotega, Esteli, Boaco, Huigalpa, and many others all represent places that are clear competitors that outweigh every single aspect that matters for a digital nomad over San Juan del Sur. Now, if you were to say, okay, Scott, great. Every factor that is purely for digital nomads, yes, we get it. But we still, people want beaches or things that are really cool. And San Juan del Sur has those in spades. And it does. But there are beaches all up and down the coast. There are so many beaches north of the reserve so Carrasso and North, they have good solid internet and very low cost and are very safe. There are also one or two who are not super safe. They're not all just because they're North safe, but there are some really great options all along the coast where you could spend a fraction as much money um, and, and potentially have access to bigger cities. And so even if it's nightlife that you want, you may get that better somewhere else. And the cost of living changes could be so significant that you can just do so much more with your time and money. There is a certain blend of things, being able to walk absolutely everywhere, having the, the downtown compressed like San Juan del Sur, the bay instead of open surfing water. Like there's a lot of things that make San Juan del Sur special and unique within Nicaragua. And I'm certainly not saying that digital nomad should just rule it out and say, well, Scott's that it's no good, I shouldn't go. That is absolutely not the case. You should evaluate it if it has the things that matter to you. Just be aware that you are weighing your personal factors, your what view you want, what weather you want, what activities you want, what restaurants you want, higher than the cost of living, safety, and infrastructure that matter primarily to your job. Nothing wrong with that. San Juan del Sur is adequate in all those things, but to call it the best place in the country, 
is, I think, very myoptic if there is one place that we would point out as professional digital nomads and as people who know Nicaragua, if you spent any time anywhere in Nicaragua, the one thing you know instantly is that San Juan del Sur is the worst, not the best, of all the places that you would consider reasonably working as a digital nomad. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That helps me drink coffee here instead of going out to a cafe where I really can't get any work done. Imagine me making these videos in the middle of a cafe or trying to edit them in the middle of a cafe or taking phone calls and doing sales and programming systems in the middle. It'd be very difficult. Uh, so as a digital nomad, trust me, this is there's reasons why we live in the cities and are close to resources and want the, the really good power grid. It's unfortunate, you know, being on the beach is fantastic. Working from the beach is something we do from time to time, and my own staff does time to time as well, but day in, day out, it is, and, and we didn't even mention, being on the beach is absolutely havoc for your electronics, and if you're on expensive cameras and the laptops and stuff, it's going to kill your equipment really quickly, and you could end up with spending thousands of dollars a year on replacing hardware, uh, whereas if you're other places, you could go five to ten years with that same hardware. Salt in the air does a lot of damage that people do not realize who do not live on a windy surf strewn coast. Like and subscribe, share with your friends. I will see all of you tomorrow. And popped up on the screen here four videos. Just pick one, go watch that. That does so, just go watch it. Could be a year old, whatever.